What is Britpop? It's a phrase that's actually quite hard to define because its meaning actually ended up changing throughout the 1990s, from the time it was coined through to the end of the decade. Britpop actually ended up being a very, very wide genre that by the end encompassed virtually every homegrown, non-manufactured music group that came out of Britain in the 1990s. A good example of this can be seen in one of the high points of the Britpop movement, which was Oasis at Nebworth. To quote the BBC, they were supported by the Charlatans, Manic Street Preachers, The Prodigy, Cast, The Chemical Brothers and Cooler Shaker in a unique celebration of Britpop dominance. Now, do you notice what's interesting about that list? The Prodigy and The Chemical Brothers are considered Britpop. Okay, they are pretty cool. Despite being a massive guitar head in the 90s, I actually went out and bought the Firestarter single by The Prodigy because it was a fantastic song. They were great musicians for old school EDM bands, but surely not the same genre as Oasis, Cast and The Manics. To me, as a young rock and roll fan growing up in Britain in the 1990s, I always saw a clear divide in the Britpop world. Britpop was just the, the big picture name, the kind of the overarching genre that just covered everything. But within that, I saw at least two subdivisions that I called pop rock and indie rock. Now, I know I may ruffle a few feathers here, but remember, this is just my personal feelings on this. This is nothing set in stone or anything. So, how would I define pop rock? The pop rock sound contained guitars. It was still rock, but it was nonetheless very synthesizer heavy. A good example being Girls and Boys by Blur or Common People by Pulp. In comparison, indie rock was almost totally guitar driven and almost never contained synthesizers. However, it did frequently include real orchestral instruments, such as strings and horns, a good example being Whatever by Oasis, Bittersweet Symphony by The Verve, and Going Out by Supergrass, which had a fantastic horn section in it, just the same as Round Our Way by Oasis. Those two sounds, pop rock and indie rock, they also represented different parts of British society. So the pop rock bands tended not always, but in general, to be Southern English. They were a little more middle class, pessimistic, and maybe a little more feminine in the way they presented themselves. Here are some of the bands I would class as 90s British pop. Some of the Blur catalogue, some of the Suede catalogue, Sleeper, Menswear, Elastica, all of whom were Southern bands. There were also, however, some northern bands I would also categorise as pop rock. Pulp, Kinnicky, The Lightning Seeds, all good examples. The British indie rock bands of the 90s, however, tended to be northern English, working class, and quite aggressively positive and self-confident and they identified mostly with the huge surge of lad culture in the 90s. Britpop bands I would class as indie rock include Oasis, The Lars, The Stone Roses, The Charlatans, The Seahorses, Ocean Colour Scene, Cast, Shed Seven, Manson, Embrace, Northern Uproar, and some people might also include The Smiths in that list but I would say they were perhaps more the godfathers of Britpop because they did split in the 80s. There were, however, also a selection of really excellent southern indie rock bands, including the Blue Tones, who are the most northern sounding southern band in the country, Supergrass, Cooler Shaker, Dodgy, and of course, the incredible Mr. Paul Weller during his solo 90s output. 
Now there were actually plenty of great indie rock bands from the other British nations too. Scotland had some cool bands, Northern Ireland too, Ash especially, but Wales, bloody hell. Wales was epic in the 1990s and gave Northern England a run for its money with some of its bands such as The Manic Street Preachers, Stereophonics, Feeder, Super Furry Animals and Catatonia. So, there was something of a uh, north-south divide between different musical elements of the Britpop movement, but it was also a working class versus middle class divide. The lyrical subjects that bands focused on also differed largely between these two subsets within Britpop. 90s British pop rock never shied away from very sentimental love songs. And it was always also a bit bleak and cynical when it sang about society or things that were happening in the world, usually from a very, very insular central London perspective. It talked about things like being too rich and feeling depressed because you had too much money. Country House by Blur being a fairly good example of that. And that was obviously something that most working class people in Britain could not relate to at all. 90s indie rock, however, spoke about the struggle of working class life at ground level. Cigarettes and Alcohol or Bittersweet Symphony are excellent examples. It almost never included love songs, especially very, very sentimental love songs. Any song in the 90s indie rock movement that talked about relationships tended to do so in a kind of conflicted or bittersweet way. Slide Away by Oasis is a really good example. Even the light-hearted She's Electric contained a sort of a, a non-committal, I'm not ready yet, taking the mickey kind of element in the lyrics. As if to drive the point home, the band Manson even had a track on the Attack of the Grey Lantern called Manson's Only Love Song. <laughs> so that's how I, as a teenager, always in my head defined the two main subcategories of Britpop, pop rock and indie rock. Pop rock was mostly southern, more feminine, more middle class and more pessimistic. Indie rock was mostly northern, associated with lad culture, more working class and much more optimistic and hopeful. But what do you think? Have I got that right or wrong? Do you see that divide in Britpop or did you really just view it all as one big melting pot? Would you categorise those various bands in the way that I did? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and as always, see you next time.